Hi, this is your coach, JDP, and welcome to You Are Excellent. You Are Excellent is all about helping to demystify coaching for underestimated people from under-resourced zip codes so that you can find entry, acceptance, belonging, success, growth, and permanence in the career of your choosing. I cannot exp express how important mentoring and coaching is to my viewers. And so with this series, we're going to better get to know a mentor. And what better mentor to have on our pod today than my first mentor, my big brother, my father figure, and an amazing all-around human being, my brother, Fred DePalm. Fred, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Sean. John. Pleasure. Oh, man. So, Fred, you know, this is, this is really special for me because this is my first in the series of Get to Know a Mentor. So I know that, you know, you have been part of my life since day one. And the beginning. The beginning, I know, right? And so what I want to do is have my audience get to know you. So, Fred, tell us about yourself. Yeah. But one of the ways that I think you and I in particular superseded our environmental condition was through hard work and education. That is something that you know, I instill in my boys and my family. And that was really handed down from our mother. But she knew the way out, as it were, was through education and hard work. So uh, I've been carrying that uh, gift with me through my whole life. And it's really me to do some pretty interesting things. In I know. I know. And you're talking about values. And we're going to talk values in a minute because those are some... Uh, fundamental and core values that were imparted upon us. But you have had a varied professional life and career. Right. So as a mentor, what are some of the experiences that you have had that led you to become a mentor? Getting an appreciation for coaching and mentoring through my experience as a mentee realizing uh, the value of giving back to the community. Um, so uh, I've also had the opportunity to coach uh, young children in various sports, uh, flag football, basketball, primarily. You know, I, I saw the impact, the positive impact that that had on young people's lives. And as they grew up and now a lot of those kids that I coached are all in college or graduated college mm -hmm. and stuff and they're doing really big things with their lives so that's a satisfying feeling and it gave me an opportunity to give back and, uh, you know from some of the gifts that I received from having had a uh, professional uh, executive coach and mentor you know did you always know you were going to be a mentor was, was this something that came naturally to you and the second part of that question is did you seek mentees or were you sought? Yeah. Sought. Yeah. So it's, it's, did it, does it come natural to me? I think so. Getting uh, mentors or men mentees to seek me out and me seeking them out. It, it depends on, on the situation. Sometimes I'll see someone who's got high potential. They don't realize that high potential. And uh, I find myself wanting to step in and provide some guidance and maybe some share some of my experiences to help them take the next step in in their career and then as far as people seeking me out you know you just have to be open to the requests when they come in because they won't necessarily come in as can you be my mentor it usually starts out with conversations of hey i'm concerned about this or what do you think about that and and if you find someone who's receptive and they're listening, my personality type is such that I will step into that mentor role and assist them. That's, that's, that's fascinating. When, as we traverse our careers, um, we always seem to have that one person, whether it be a teacher, whether it be a relative, whether it's another professional that has had an impact on the trajectory of our career. So Fred, I, my question to you here is, who is that person that has had a impact on you and the trajectory of your career and where you are? 
yeah, that's my executive coach. Uh, I was in a situation where I was a director in a pharmaceutical organization, and once a year, uh, the high potential performers are brought up to the executive leadership team, and the questions asked, ready or not ready. And my name came up. The assessment was not ready yet. So when I was communicated that message, I said, so what do I do to get ready? And the company in their wisdom said, we are going to pay for an executive coach for you for a year. And that person that I connected with was Bill Torsiana. And he's a very successful professor of executive coaching business here in the Bay Area. And uh, he and I went through a, a years of working together. And uh, that was probably about 15 years ago. And we're still friends. We became friends. So he not only did become a, a, a professional coach for the workplace, but it spilled over into my personal life. And when I did my first year with him, my very next job, uh, I moved into a vice president role, and then the next job after that, I became uh, chief information officer. So it, it that was a pivotal point in my career. And what Bill did was he taught me how to navigate politics, how to present myself in a in a professional and business way, and how to understand the lexicon of business and, and business decision making, which mm -hmm. many of us don't have the opportunity to experience or witness. Because I found myself getting into uh, into rooms that were usually closed to people like us, like the boardroom, and the experiencing that uh, and then understanding what's going on, understanding what's being said, and more important, what are the messages behind what's being said. Bill helped me navigate that, and it was invaluable, and that's where my uh, executive career started and took off. That's that's fascinating, Fred. Mentors and coaches, right, are the people that sometimes show up, whether by plan or by some sort of intervention that really kind of push our, us to be better at you know, being human, at being professionals, at, you know, a number mm -hmm. of things. And it's rare that we actually find that one person that starts off in a professional relationship as coach. And right. then the, the, the relationship uh, evolves into a friendship, a kinship, a right. partnership, a, a, a exactly. you know, it's, it's really, really cool. And so thank you for sharing that with us. You know, as I engage in coaching, Right. My particular uh, focus is underestimated people from under-resourced zip codes. And one of the key themes across many of my clients is, and, here, and you'll know this when you hear it, imposter syndrome. Mm. Right. So I guess my question to you as a, a man of color who's navigating the corridors of the C-suite in really impressive organizations, and you have an impressive resume, let me tell you. Have you ever faced imposter syndrome, an imposter syndrome moment where you walk into a room full of the, all these high-powered executives, and then you begin to question your worthiness to be in the room? Uh, imposter, in the room? Uh, imposter syndrome, no, because I worked, and to be quite direct, I worked my ass off. To, to, to step into that room. So I never felt like a, an imposter because I, sorry, my, my, uh, my dog is uh, chasing squirrels or something. You wouldn't be human if it wasn't for dog. <laughs> Feeling, uh, you know, a sense of, of, you know, why is he here? Why does he deserve to be here? You know, and having to constantly prove myself is something that I felt feel constantly every time I walk into a room because, you know, boardrooms are highly political and um, there's a lot of big egos and a lot of, you know, pushing, pulling and negotiating and so forth. And if you're not part of the club, it is very difficult to gain acceptance. So that was imposter syndrome, no, because I felt I, I earned that right or that opportunity, but 
fitting in with uh, every boardroom I've ever been on, with the exception of the Port of Oakland. Um, mm. I was the only person that looked like me. Mm. And, um, you know, that comes with certain stigmas, challenges, and so forth. But again, be prepared if you're on point and you're communicating, you know, uh, value, value added messaging that they need to hear at perception that feeling starts going away. But you, you, you constantly have to, like my mother used to say, you know, because you're a man of color, you have to work twice as hard as everybody else. Again, another value that I grew up with. So that's imposter syndrome, no, but certainly I, every day I felt like I had to earn the opportunity to be invited into that room. Well, thank you for that, Fred. And some of my, one, another theme, right, and it, is, is worthiness. Uh, many of my coaches don't feel as if because of perhaps their background or perhaps because mm -hmm. of their f family circumstance or maybe perhaps because they didn't go to the right school or maybe they don't have a degree or whatever their circumstance might be. Right. Worthiness always comes up. Yeah. How would you define worthiness? Uh, it's, uh, it's belief in yourself, confidence in what you do and you bring to the table and uh, a sense of self-respect. If you can uh, accept those three things in a positive way, you are worthy. Mm -hmm. um, and then the opportunities will start to align and uh, benefit your career and your life. But um, everyone has value. Everyone um, can contribute something to a team. And, you know, this just goes back to my concept of, of team. Uh, that's critical. Everyone contributes something to a team. If you look at a football team, you know, you, you got the big line and then you've got, you know, uh, your, your speedy running backs and you got your quarterback and you got your receivers and you got your defensive players. So you got speed positions, strength positions. Nobody can do it all. So you have to understand what your role is, what you bring to the team and do it well because you have value. And that once you understand your value, that also contributes to the sense of worthiness. So, yeah, I remember my son, when he was playing high school football, he was frustrated because some of the kids that he came up with out of junior high school were running all over the field. And he was an offensive lineman. And he goes, you know, I can never beat so-and-so in a sprint. I can never do this. I can do that. I said, you don't have to. You have to cover five square yards on the field. He has to cover the whole field because of his position. So it, they don't expect you to be beating him in sprints. You're bigger, you're heavier, and you only have to cover five square yards. He's got to cover the whole field, so he needs to be fast. He needs to have endurance. He, you know, so understand what your role is and execute your role as a team member, and then the whole team can enjoy the journey. But um, everyone brings value to, to a team situation. That's awesome. Thank you for that, Fred. So here we are, you know, we're talking about, you know, we touched on imposter syndrome. We talked in depth a little bit about worthiness and what does worthy mean and, and your uh, sage advice about uh, how to tap into that uniqueness of right. that, 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 that our own intrinsic value of how we value ourselves and our worth. Let's put it all together. Let's just say, you know, one of your mentees comes up to you and says, hey, uh, Fred, I'm, I'm in this particular situation. I'm going to be uh, in that. I've been invited to that executive room. And quite frankly, I, I got the bubble guts about it. Yeah. How would yeah. you recommend the non-executive? What would you recommend they do in that particular situation for a non-executive? Yeah, of course. You know, first of all, I, I engaged in a conversation about, you know, how this came about. What, what, they, what, what is uh, the desired outcome that they're looking for, right? What, what, what is the, the, the value add that they're bringing to that, to that meeting or any meeting for that matter, but particularly, you know, stepping into the, to the boardroom? 
And once they can articulate that, then I can help them develop a plan for how they should probably uh, uh, either structure their presentation um, or give them advice on how to enter the room, right? Uh, shoulders back with confidence, but not being overly cocky, but more importantly, being prepared. Take the time to prepare for that meeting or any meeting, because you want to be in a position where if a question is asked, you can answer that question. If you have to say, oh, I'll get back to you, you've just wasted everybody's time. Be prepared. Do the work ahead of time, and you will be okay. So um, so, what you're saying, so in, so in short, what you're saying is better to be prepared and not need it than need it and not be prepared. And I'm not perfect because I've been in that situation and it was very uncomfortable and, quite frankly, a career altering in not a good way. So you want to be you want to be prepared. OK, that's that's great. That's great. Thank you for that. You yeah. talk a lot about you know our mother and the values right and um not only that but the enforcement of those values <laughs> la chancleta for those of you who don't know what that chancleta is uh, uh freddie and i are afro caribeños because we're uh of puerto rican and curacao extraction and um we both speak fluent spanish and our mother, one of the things in Latin culture is that moms have the slipper or the chancla. And uh, they're, they're, they, uh, they are adept martial artists when it comes to um, wielding the chancleta and the enforcement of house rules and behavior and so forth. But that's with, with, with precise. With precise. Oh, man, my mother hits you at 50 yards. No issue. <laughs> Bam. <laughs> anyway. One of the things that what we've just been talking about are values. How important would you say values are for, for the for the mentee? Yeah, um, values are, are are critical. What's what's most important about values is they're usually instilled in you by your parents, um, and as you get older, they may shift based on your experiences and, and environment. But values are the core essence of who and what you are. And that will guide your decision making through your professional life, through your personal life. So it's, it's important to take time to reflect on understanding what are your values, right? And then the next question becomes, once you understand that, is what are you willing or not willing to do based on your values? So any decision you make is uh, your, your values are at the core of who and what you are so that's that's why it's it's uh it's good for you know any mentee or person who's being coached to take some time and think about that like what are what are your core values and uh once you understand that it it will basically calm your inner self calm your mind and then you can you can focus and move forward um, high fun. So when we talk about our core values, right, hmm. how important is that to the individual in helping them to drive their decision-making process? And I ask because sometimes um, decisions are made uh, that might run contrary to our values and therefore lead us to situations that are, let's just call them suboptimal. Yeah. So, um, what the thought that popped into my head was ethical dilemma, right? Mm -hmm. If you ever find yourself in an ethical dilemma, which is basically a decision is being made or you're asked to do something that ethically you don't agree with, well, your ethics are at the foundation of that are your values, right? It's going against your core values. So you have to decide whether or not what you're being asked to do is ethical, especially if you're facing this ethical dilemma and you need to think it through. And those types of situations are perfect for bringing forward to your mentor or coach. Really? Because they will help you think that through, tell you what the pros and cons are, and um, help you help you make the decision on how you want to respond 
or resolve the ethical dilemma. And it's going to happen a lot in business. Mm. Um, so, uh, and then if it's something that uh, you can't do, then there's uh, methods and approaches for discussing that with your management uh, manager and see if you can work it through. But don't harbor an ethical dilemma because the more you hold it in at some point, a decision has to be made, and you, as a as a as a value team member, you want to be able to make that decision. So that's something that a coach or mentor can help you navigate through. The next thing that I want to talk to you about, Fred, yeah. is what would you say is the importance of goal setting for the non-executive? It's a goal setting. Goal setting is critical um, because uh, not only personally does it help you plot out what you want to achieve in, let's use 12 months as the, the window, right? 12 month calendar year. But um, it, it gives you the opportunity to think about what the organization is trying to achieve and how you contribute or how you add value to the organization's uh, strategic intent. And imperative, um, and how you fit in, how you're going to contribute to help the organization, uh, your team, your organization, your company meet their annual objectives. So goal setting is very important, and um, you know, take time to think about that. Because one of the examples I've uh, shared with you previously is at the beginning of every year, so early January. I sit down and I think about the last year in a particular position, job, or role. And then I think, did I accomplish what I set out to do? Did I provide value to the organization? Did I enjoy what I did? And if I did, then I start looking forward and saying, okay, so here's what the next year looks like. Here are some things I might want to improve on. Here are some things I might want to expound on and then map it out and you know, push forward. But sometimes I found that, you know, one of the questions that I asked myself was not positive. So then I had a decision I had to make, what I call a management decision. You know, once or twice that that's happened to me, it, it put me in a position where I had to pivot, but it's valuable to take that time to understand how you're contributing, were you successful in contributing, and did you enjoy it? Because if you don't enjoy what you're doing, you're not going to perform at peak levels. Good. So just think about that. That's awesome. If you don't like what you're doing, you're not going to perform at peak levels. Right. Plan and plan. Get Step out of the now and analyze what was, what is, and create a vision for what will be. I like exactly. that. Yeah. Hey, Fred. Yes, sir. How you, how you feeling? Pretty good. How about you? <laughs> good. How's this going for you? Is this what you expected? Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, it's, 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 it's good. It's, it's, you know, personally, I tend to, to uh, think a lot and uh, even think on the fly. So a lot, of, uh, a lot of good stuff has come up from your, you know, questions that has me you know, thinking and confirming my, my approach, my beliefs and so forth. So yeah, thanks. I appreciate this opportunity. All right. So you are one of the funniest people to be around. Uh, you have a great heart. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Fred is, is, is a very big guy, he's six, five, six, six, and, and just a former football player. So you can draw a picture of in your own imagination, but right. for my audience and for the purpose of this, uh, segment, get to know a mentor. I want to ask you a few questions that will probe sure. the depths of Fred, the person. Are you okay. up to take the get to know a mentor questionnaire? The setup has me nervous, but go ahead. <laughs> All right. First question, Fred. Yes. Favorite sport? So you mentioned one of my favorite sports is football. Um, I played at a high level in football and um, my boys uh, played football in high school, but they also played rugby. 
And going into college, my boys continued the path of rugby and they gave up football. So I have become a rugby fan. Oh, um, I love the sport. It's, it's a great sport. And um, it's a sport, again, there's, there's, a, there's a position for everybody, right? You know, big guys, small, fast guys, medium-sized guys, guys who hit hard, guys who, you know, uh, it's, it's a great sport. So. so you said your boys play rugby at the university level, right? Yes. Where, where are yes. they playing? So my oldest son is, uh, uh, he's about to graduate. I think he's graduates next December. And he was a swimmer. He didn't play rugby, but he's at Sonoma State University. Uh, my middle son, who is a rugby player, he plays for the University of California at Davis. And um, he just uh, retired as a junior. Um because he's focusing on his pre-law studies and he next week he's heading out to Washington DC to do a three month internship. He's, he's doing, doing big things. So happy for him. Then my youngest son, who's a freshman, um, he's at the uh, university of Wisconsin, Madison. And as a freshman, he made the A side in, in rugby. So he's, he's excelling. Uh, he did the whole fall rugby season, and now they're training for rugby sevens, which is in the spring. Mm. And um, you know, and then he's holding down a high GPA. I mean, it, they're just they're just doing great. So rugby is awesome. a sport that I'm very passionate about these days. Great testament to you and Luz. Luz is Fred's Fred's wife. Okay, yeah. next yes, question. Sir. Yes. Cats or dogs? Dogs. I know you're you're a cat and dog person, but we're dog people. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next question: Mountains or ocean? Ocean. Um, and love the mountains, but love the ocean more. And I think it's because of the opportunity we got uh, during our teenage years to live in Puerto Rico, where I got a real appreciation for the ocean. Because the ocean in New York, you know, is nothing like in the Caribbean. So ocean for me. Okay. Okay. Now this next question has caused some past guests, some confusion. Okay. All right. So I'm not limited to any genre or form or anything like that. Okay. Favorite artist. Dave Chappelle. All right. Why? <laughs> And not only is he hilarious, he's genius. Mm. You know, his his comedy is um, broad. It touches on and is appealing to many different audiences. But more importantly, it's deep. I mean, Dave Chappelle, he's a true genius. He, he, you know, he really is. And he's funny as hell. I really miss the, the Chappelle show. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, yeah. that, that's awesome. So last question. Favorite food or cuisine? Uh, Puerto Rican food. Um, I'm a big fan of all kinds of Asian food, but you know I got to give props to to the uh, to the original to the motherland, right, the origin, the motherland, right? The foundation. Uh, well, Fred, Puerto Rican. Fred, thank you so much. I feel that by answering the questionnaire, you are now known. <laughs> thank you. So, you know, we're we're coming up on time. Um, any last words? Yeah, sure. So for people who um, are listening to this or might be client base, you know, seriously think about um, getting a, a minimum a mentor. And if you can, uh, a professional coach. Um, it's helped me a lot in my career and in my life. It, it, you know, it will, it's always good to have someone to talk to, to help you navigate through any difficult situations and talk it through. Um, and, you know, the other thing is, uh, you know, I have a, a saying uh, that I believe in and it's, you know, it's posted on my Facebook page and stuff. And it goes like this. Stay focused, be positive, move forward. There you it can is. adopt those three things in your life. You can get through anything. Stay focused, be positive, move forward. And on that note, Fred, thank you so much for being my inaugural guest on Get to know a mentor. My pleasure, man. And continue success. You're doing great. And this is gonna this is gonna help a lot of people. I'm excited. So this is your coach JDP.
talking to his first mentor, big brother, an all around great guy, Fred DePalm. Fred can be found on LinkedIn. Um, so check him out. This is your coach, JDP. And remember, you are excellent. Take care. We'll see you next time.